Welcome to Women Read Scripture, Come Follow Me, New Testament. Today we're going to be talking about the first lesson of Come Follow Me, We Are Responsible for Our Own Learning. I'm Mariana Richardson. And I'm Annette Marie Lantos Tilleman Dick. And I'm Christine Thackeray. We are so excited to be back here with you. And today it's something that's kind of heart touching and heart rending too, especially those of us that might have people in our families that are having struggling times with their testimonies. But one of the things that just really helped me understand as we go forward with this wonderful lesson was from last October conference. The prophet gave us some very strong counsel on things that we must do to make sure that we are testimony strong especially for this coming year. He specifically said, I plead with you now to take charge of your own testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Work for it. Nurture it so that it will grow. Feed it truth. Don't pollute it with false philosophies of unbelieving men and women. As you make the continued strengthening of your testimony of Jesus Christ your highest priority, watch for miracles to happen in your life. As I think about the New Testament, this for me is kind of my mantra for this year, is how am I going to make sure that my testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel is stronger because of my study of the New Testament? So I want to ask both of you, as you thought about that overcoming the world and finding rest, wonderful talk that President Nelson gave us, Were there any specific things, because he talked a lot about specific things that we can do to strengthen our testimonies. And so I wanted to see what some of your thoughts were on that. Well, I was shaking in my boots when he said, watch for miracles in the coming days. He didn't say like years, and I wanted to be so far away. And it was just like, ah, but um, but there are miracles all around us. So I'm I'm a little calmer now than I was when I heard him say that. Did you have any oh, thoughts too? Well, I did. I, I, um, I think that you know one of the things that I really loved was what we are willing to give up for our commitment to serve the Lord, oh, and that really that. touched me. And I love it because I love the idea of sacrifice was transformed for me when I understood the root of that word, which is sacred. Sacred is the root of the word sacrifice, and sacrifice means giving up. To the sacred. Mm-hmm. And what things in our lives, what things that are not really worthwhile, that take time, that that sort of deplete our focus on thinking of what we can do to follow the Savior more closely, are we willing to give up to follow him? Oh, I love that because one of the favorite little quotes that he says is, give away your favorite sins. And I think all of us have favorite sins that we just don't want to give up. You're making me feel so guilty because I have this app on my phone that I love to play when I'm sitting waiting for kids or doing other things. (laughs) And I know I should delete it, but I haven't yet. Maybe it's meditation for you. No, I I don't think it is. It's just a time consumer that I shouldn't do. When You you know, I think that it's important not to be too harsh in the way that we evaluate (laughs) ourselves in some ways. And yet, you know, there may be things that we don't need right. and that will open up vistas of time and space to put in things we do need. And you say I agree. So and I do think that as I <laughs> kind of analyzed his talk and looked at those specific things, I just wanted to share a few of them. He said, of course, give away your favorite sins. Seek for and follow the promptings of the Spirit. Do something good for another person. Repent daily, keep sacred covenants, live the doctrine of Christ, find yourself truth, don't pollute yourself with false philosophies, make strengthening your testimony of Jesus Christ your highest priority, which I think is kind of what you were talking about, Annette, that we do make it a higher priority in our life. Which which is, you know, it has to be a decision because there are so many things fighting to be at the top oh, of our definitely. list. Yeah. And, you know, and we and we need to... We need to consciously evaluate, am I putting the Savior first? Am I putting following him first? 
And then he said, watch for those miracles, which we talked about. That might be scary because, you know, <laughs> the fact that we need miracles is kind of I scary. Know. And then let him know through your prayers and actions that you are serious about overcoming the world. I love that, that it becomes, we, we get the Lord involved. We can't do this on our own. We can't. And so it's only through his help that can we truly overcome those little sins that and we, we have talked to about. become serious in order to let him know we're serious, which is a process in itself, because sometimes we're not that serious about it. We just want it to be the outside, you it's know, true. the things that people see and annoy them. You exactly. know, when you talk about miracles, I, I recently had a hip replacement, and I will say that it reminds me so much of the miracles of Jesus. But you don't know right away. You know, you have this thing, and for a while you don't feel so great, and you're thinking... Mm -hmm whoa, what did I do? I hope that it is going to actually work. And then it feels miraculous because you do feel like you've gone from being like any of those individuals in the scriptures who came to Jesus who were lame, who couldn't who were walk. Who lame and couldn't who walk. Who could not walk. Exactly. Who needed to be lowered down because they had an ailment. Suddenly you are able to get up truly as if you were a refreshed human being, you oh, know, it is and wonderful. that the Savior's it hand has touched you. I do feel that we do have to recognize the miracles. That's they may true. not come in the same way that we read there, but they are still God's well, miracles, miracles in, in our, our lives. lives. And I think I the miracle of physical healing and that miracle of spiritual healing when we've been so injured and suddenly we can face a situation yes. and not carry that hurt with us. The well, miracle of gift. forgiveness. Oh. And to oh, in we our, there. Not for us, but also <laughs> as we do it right. and the way it transforms Absolutely. our relationship. And so people. this is exactly the next one he says. He says, ask the Lord to enlighten your mind and send the help you need. And that goes right along with that idea like of feeling also those positive feelings. Sometimes we have those negative divisive thoughts that are so much a part of our society right now and to be able to pray to the Lord and say I need healing I need help to be able to have those positive feelings rather than negative sure. and then the next one this is the one that I picked to do I mean we can't do it all at the same time I mean hopefully over a lifetime we can but this is the one that I picked in my life it says each day Record the thoughts that come in you as you pray, then follow through diligently. Now, I'm not 100%, but I do now because of what the prophet said, I have a journal right next to my bed. And after I pray, I get my journal and I just write one little sentence. That is so good. And for me, it's been such a positive experience because then I can just quickly look back and say, oh, yeah, I felt that way after I prayed. Oh, yes, I felt that way. And it's just constant reminder. Sometimes a prayer and feeling is a miracle. You know, Ma Marianne, I have to say one thing about this because I was thinking about it just today. You know, they used to be very much about writing down your goals and write, and then a little bit less, which I appreciate because sometimes <laughs> life is overwhelming and it's sort of too much. I don't need to much. overwhelm myself. Yes, I it's know. too much. But I will say that this Thanksgiving, I asked everybody to write down something for which they were truly grateful. And I said, and then write down something you're going to do that will be a blessing to someone else. Yes. And I wrote down some silly thing that we'd made this mix, and I was going to give it to three people. Oh, and I love it. Of course, it's never so easy. You know, you think, oh, that sounds I know. doable, doable. Right. But then life crowds in on you. I know that because I wrote it down, I was determined, and it happened, and right. what a good feeling it was. So I don't think you need to map out your life entirely, but this writing down of your impressions, writing down of a small goal, you may not it does. Know exactly, but it, it makes can a huge help you. difference. Wow. Yes. And then the last point that he made was to spend more time in the temple, and seek to understand how the temple teaches you to rise above the fallen world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And of course, his focus so much is on the temple and covenants. And it's interesting to me, as we think about the New Testament, 
how the Savior's life also was so centered around the temple there in Jerusalem. And we're going to be talking a lot about the temple in terms of how it affected the Savior's ministry, how he taught at the temple, and the things that he taught at the temple. But also this idea we kind of talked last time about the Old and New Testament and how he gives us the new covenant, the new understanding about temple covenants and what they meant as he brought about this New Testament for the Jews and then for the Gentiles and then for the whole world, which is what we're going to be talking about. So as I look forward for the New Testament year, I really like to have a theme. Just like Annette was saying, it's it's really helpful for me to have kind of a goal. And so my goal, my theme is this idea of ACT. And yes, I'm also a business person, so I love acronyms. I need acronyms. But ACT for me is going to stand for first the atonement, for Christ, and then for testimony. But also as I read, I'm also going to look for analogies or we talk about the parables, but ways that they can be a part of my life. And then I'm also going to focus on covenants and then how the teachings of the doctrine of Christ can touch my life as well. So ACT is kind of my acronym for this year that I'm hoping that through these understandings of the atonement, Christ, testimony, and analogies, covenant, and teachings, that I will be able to act differently, that I will have my heart changed, that I will have my actions changed, and that my testimony of the Savior will grow. So my question now is, you know, some thoughts that you have on some things that you're looking forward to, some goals that you have in your reading as we look forward to the New Testament this year. To do it consistently? (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. I know. My biggest thing is that I like to like read a book in a sitting. So even if it's like a thousand page book, I'll stay up all night and just read it once. (laughs) And so I'm the same way with even the New Testament and the Book of Mormon. I love reading the Book of Mormon cover to cover in one sitting. So to do a a little piece. Oh, it's a story. story. That's the way I do everything. It's just like, So then to have to do a little piece here and a little piece there, which actually I know gives you more, but I'm usually a catch up where I put off and then I'll just like flood it. Do it all. So that's where I'm going to really try and do the little sprinkle and be more balanced. It talks about that in my patriarchal blessing I'm supposed to. And I laughed. It's just to make me always know that that's something I have to work on, you know. So that's my goal is to do a little bit at a time, to not spend the whole day you know, and the co- kids are like, you're supposed to be doing the laundry. No, I'm just reading today. I love it. So I love well, you can better. still have those days. Those I days know. still are wonderful. Well, they, they just they happen. Are. We just they do. Go, but, they just happen. But I am going to try and be more consistent. So I am excited about that one. I, I love both of these <laughs> perspectives. I'm thinking I want my own acronym, which I have not thought of yet. <laughs> but but I the one that comes to me is integrate and that I want to and I want to do, I get so many letters and you know, I love to talk. So sure. I'm going to, I'm going to have something for all those letters, love but, it. but I do the concept of integration and of integrating what I read, what I learn, the inspiration I get nice. into my daily life and my human relations love it. and do that on an ongoing basis every day. I love that. Well, the other thing that I was thinking a lot about also came from General Conference, and it was Elder Jonathan S. Schmidt's talk that was specifically about how when we partake of the sacrament, we also indicate that we are willing to take his name upon us. And he went on, and I, I love this, one of, the, my, one of my goals this year is he talked about that he had a personal list of 300 names of the Savior. And I thought, all right, I want to find 301. (laughs) So I can say that I have that many. (laughs) I'm not competitive at all. (laughs) But as I focus on Christ, I also want to think, you know, he talks about how every week he thinks about a name and then he tries to, you know, have his actions, you know, going back to act, has his actions kind of centered around that name of Christ for that week. And I love that. So I wanted to ask you, is there a name of Christ 
that you just, you know, think about and that just brings warmth into your heart as you think about when it. When you said that, the first thing that came to mind was wonderful. Oh, <laughs> and the first thing it that is came wonderful. Was Glorious. Oh, and you know? that one is a good but one. But how beautiful they a are. A princess of yeah, peace. Yes. But I, I mean, love I that. love. And what is so exciting about this? There's so much. Christine can have one thing that exactly. absolutely comes. <laughs> and another to me. And they both open whole vistas of ways of experiencing and giving back to life. Well, for me, right. the name that, that really struck me was anointed. And one mm. of the things that it talks about in this first curriculum, as we talk about Come Follow Me, that we focus on a word, and then we look at that attribute of Christ and really delve in. And it talks about that in, in Come Follow Me. So I took the word anointed, and... The reason why I also picked that word, last week we talked about this idea of the Greeks and the Romans, and we have this word Christos, which is the Greek, and you can say it probably Meshia. better than me, and Mishia, yeah. which is Messiah, which Means is anointed in Hebrew. And the Hebrew. So we have the no anointed one, and for me that is so beautiful to think about the Savior as the anointed one the one that was anointed by our Heavenly Father to bring his gospel to be his personage here on earth, to be the one that is bringing forth this New Testament, this new covenant, just like our Savior Jesus Christ was the Lord Jehovah of the Old Testament. So as I was contemplating this and studying it, I actually found two specific places in the New Testament the first one is where the Messiah himself proclaims himself as the anointed one. And that's found, of course, in Luke chapter 4. And in both of these instances that we're going to talk about in the New Testament about the anointed one, it's interesting to me to see that we're talking back to the Old Testament. So yeah. we have to realize as we talk about the New Testament, we are also going to be talking about some of the things that we studied last year as well. So in this, and I know this is a time that both of you remember well, the Savior is at the beginning of his ministry, and he's come back home. He's come back to his hometown, <laughs> and it's the Sabbath, a rough. <laughs> and everybody's you know sitting around the congregation. You can imagine the little synagogue, and in Jewish tradition, you know somebody is given the you know the Old Testament to read, and so it was delivered unto. Jesus, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me, and there's the anointed, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And you can imagine, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The thing that I find so fascinating about this is that he's proclaiming himself as the Christ, the Messiah the anointed one. And yet, what is the response of these people who knew him so well since he was a baby? You know, this was his hometown. And all of them are saying, but he's Joseph's son. What is he saying? And blasphemy. Exactly. Blasphemy. I mean, was, how can he say he that? He'd be stoned. I mean, what, they, what did they expect? You know, that's a scripture, too, that what did you expect to see, you know? know. And they didn't expect to see this, no, that it would be didn't. a boy who they knew was the son of someone born, who lived in their who town right. and who had grown up. They weren't asking how good he was or whether he'd been. No, it was just like, yeah, no, you know? I mean, they, it, didn't, it didn't seem plausible. And it seemed it seemed very bold. Oh, very bold. <laughs> and I think it's interesting when we think about what the list that Isaiah gave of what the Savior was going to do. What was the anointed one going to do? And if you look at it, it is everything that he did. He 
preach the gospel to the poor. I mean, those are the ones that he focused on. He um, healed the brokenhearted. He preached deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. I mean, whether Still it's spiritual blinds. or physical blindness, yeah. both. And I love when he talks about healing the bruised, the people that just feel beat up and you don't even yes. see it, but you just feel like you're constantly... And I just love this scripture and this idea of who the anointed one is and what the anointed one will do. And that's what the Savior did during his ministry. The next time that we he see this anointed one actually is also another reference to the Psalms, when the Psalms talk about what the anointed one will do. And this is after basically Peter and John have been, you know, put in front of the Sanhedrin. Basically what happened was they were still preaching Christ. This is just right after, you know, the Savior's crucified and the resurrection. And Peter and John are still, I mean, they thought the problem was going to be gone, you know, because they took care of it. But no, Peter and John are preaching about Jesus Christ. And the people all around him are also listening and being a part of this. And so they bring him in front of the council, and the council is like, stop it. You know, stop <laughs> it right now. And Peter and John said, we can't. You know, this is this is our testimony. This is what we believe in. And so they threaten. They do a lot of threatening, but they realize we really can't do anything because the people are on Peter and John's side. So they let them go. But after letting them go, this is the great part. They went to other people who were believers, and they told them about what happened and how they were let go. And then they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and sea and all that them is, who by the mouth of the servant David has said, and this is quoting Psalms chapter two, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ the anointed one, for a, of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. And then they go on and they talk about how because of the anointed one and the fact that they received that priesthood authority from him, from the anointed one, from Christ, from the Messiah, that they are able to continue those signs, those wonders, that uh, wonderful vision of Isaiah, of all the things that the Savior was going to do, but also give other men the power and authority to do as the anointed one who allows other men to be anointed. I may say something inappropriate, but it's coming out. At the temple, each one of us become anointed. Yes. And I think it's so beautiful because during that anointing, it's women anointing each other. And that idea of being anointed, and during the New Testament times, that wasn't the case. They didn't have that. But we have been given that. And I think that idea that we are also anointed, and anointed to not have our voices be held, but to share our testimonies and those truths. And that's part of those promises as you listen to them, to learn Christ's words and then share them openly with our families and anyone who will listen. And I, I just think truly being that kind of anointed, living those promises, if you've heard them, is just coming to me so strongly to be that person. And I know, Christine, you have some really strong thoughts and feelings about this idea of oil and making sure because and you're anointed with oil. we're anointed with oil. So interesting. Oh, so wow. I would love like you're blowing my mind. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> well, um, okay. Are you ready for? I'm ready. For, okay. I'm ready for the ten well, virgins. And right. Okay. So my oil. the ten virgins twist and go down because I'm going from that come follow me curriculum, and there was two stories that are spoken of in that. And the first one is of the young rich man. And I have made a decision 
that when I pass to the other side of the veil, the first thing I'm going to do is seek out that poor boy and give him a big <laughs> hug. And I'm saying, so sorry that we've like dissed you all <laughs> these years because you did keep the covenants for 2,000 <laughs> years. Everybody uses I know, so an example. sorry. I so know. I'm going to be another right. disser. Sorry. So here it comes. But anyway, the thing that caught me is he goes to the Savior and he says, good master, what should I do to have eternal life? Right. And you know, the Lord says, if thou wilt enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. And so the rich young man says, I've done that from my youth up. I'm all good. He was a good guy. Right. Very what good. lack I yet? And at this point, um, the Lord asked him to sell everything and come follow me. And he leaves sad because he can't do it because there's too much. It's a favorite so sin. It was it was like cute, we were talking about. Because we were talking about it around my kitchen table with my kids. And they're like, well, what did he expect? Did he just <laughs> expect Heavenly Father to, or Jesus to say, good job, you're done. Just keep on go doing what you're doing. What was his expectation? Well, I, I love that, that that was your kid's reaction because <laughs> my reaction would be, what did Jesus expect? Did he expect him to really do it? You know, but, but of, of course he did. But you had to know who you were talking about. Right. He knew it was, he was a great teacher, but mm -hmm. he, he, knew did not, it. he did not maybe it. know that this was I'm the right. anointed. Right. Well, because exactly. if he had known, that, he would have done it. If he had it. that testimony. If he would have had that testimony. And I think but that I maybe think that, so. was, that was but the test. But sometimes right? even knowing your heart isn't ready. Sometimes That's you true. know, like with dieting, sometimes you know it'd be good, but you want the chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's just not going to happen. I always want the chocolate cake. <laughs> so anyway, but in, in contrast, there's this great story about um, the apostles of John the Baptist. Uh, apostles, sorry, disciples. Disciples of John the Baptist. And they're sitting, um, kind of listening to John the Baptist, and Christ comes to be baptized. And the next day... When Christ comes, John says really clearly, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Right. And so these disciples hear John's testimony, and they come up and run up to the Savior. And the question that they, he, um, as they stand there, it says they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned unto them and said, What seek ye? And that phrase, what seek ye, but... Do you know what their answer was to that question, what seek ye? We never talk about that answer. They said, we want to know where you live. They said, I where dwellest that. thou? And then Christ said, come and see. And they follow him to his house and stay the night. And this idea that they were so prepared, the Lord didn't have to say, come follow me. They're like, we're following we're you. We're following no you wherever you go. We want to follow you. Where are you going? And we want to go there. And we want to be there. We want to be in your we home. Want what want a be different there. answer. Mm -hmm. What a different question. I love that. And, and kind of the difference in heart between someone who's saying, okay, what do you want next, Lord, versus oh, that's you and your journal. When you say your prayer and then you, what are those feelings? And when you follow through on them, you're not asking to be given. You're, you're, following. you're being proactive. Right. And so the Spirit talks to you and you work. That's a whole different mindset. I love that. So as I was reading the story of the Ten Virgins again, I thought, what makes them foolish versus wise? And if you know me, I may be overly judgmental at times. We won't go there. But sometimes I thought you, you were going to say, maybe I'm foolish sometimes. <laughs> I am <laughs> foolish. <laughs> but you know how some people, you just think they're silly the way they wear their hair, or they're silly the way they you know, talk, or they're silly with their attitudes. But the thing that made someone foolish versus wise wasn't anything external. It was one thing. And so... Um, let me find where it is. And I keep on doing that. Um, the line was whether they brought extra oil. The ones who only relied on the little lamp and the oil in that oh, lamp were I unwise. Right. But the wise ones brought an extra vessel with additional oil. Charger. And so there were the two. <laughs> A charger. I love that. And an extra power source. <laughs> right. But the interesting thing to me is I think all of those extra vessels could have looked different and could have been different. Mm -hmm. But the key was that they had it. And um, Bednar said, 
We should not expect the churches and organizations to teach or tell us everything we need to know and do to become devoted disciples and endure valiantly to the end. Rather, our personal responsibility is to learn what we should learn, to live as we know we should live, and to become who the master would have us become. And our homes are the ultimate setting for living, learning, and becoming. Oh, I and that's that. where I think that if you look at the original lamp as the organization of the church, and it gives us oil and light and beauty, and it's what we need to hold up. We need to have those covenants in order to enter the kingdom of God. We have to be baptized. We have to have those that lamp. Temple covenants. But outside of that, the extra oil are the things that we do in our homes, the things that we do in our lives that aren't, you know, commanded, that aren't a responsibility. It's that attitude. Well, if we are going to become a light, if we want to follow the Savior, I mean, he's the light of the world, we are our little lights, and we each in one way are anointed. Every person born on this earth is a child of God. Each person has an anointing mm -hmm. to become what the Lord wants them to become and Absolutely. to shine with that light. And we need ongoing sources of energy to be able to shine forth and become and be what the church helps us to understand we want to become. You right. know, we get a lot of input, but then if we really absorb it and we really want it to go forth into the world, it's, a, it's an ongoing operation that needs a lot of nurturing and nourishment and oil. Right. And a lot and of extra oil. It. We well, need to find that. And the list that President Nelson gave us at last conference, all of that list, every single one, were things that we do yes. outside of church, individually, with right. our families and, and, and with ourselves and God. And so you're absolutely right. That's, that's that extra oil that we have to have to make it through these latter days. I know. I love that. And, and I went through and looked at that. When you look at giving away your favorite sin, it's something you do alone. Seeking for the promptings of the Spirit is something that you do. It's between you and the Lord. Doing something good for other people. Repenting daily. Keeping covenants. The one I loved was feeding yourself truth. And when you were talking about it, um, to me, that was a huge one. I did want to talk um, really briefly about Paul's, this is way off the side, but it comes back, Paul's mission to Berea. So he went to Thessalonica where the people didn't listen and they kicked him out. And then he goes to Berea and in Acts 17, and I'm going to have to flip to Acts, in Berea, he comes at night um, to some Jews in the synagogue and these were more noble than the ones in Thessalonica who kicked him out um, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind oh, and that. searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. And so that there are a lot of Greek women that are listening and learning. But that idea of searching the scriptures daily if these things are so, you're searching to prove, you're searching to find and to learn what you need to do. And I think that that's kind of what you said earlier. You know, that's so powerful. As a matter of fact, it just brought to mind a scripture that my daughter, Amy, when she was a, a missionary in Argentina, we went to go visit her at the end, you know, of her mission to bring her back home. And as we were there, we noticed a ring that she had that she didn't have before. And I said, oh, I love that ring. What did you do? And she said, well, I, I wanted to have, there was a, a little man there in Argentina that would do, uh, you know, just a very simple ring, but then, you know, inscribe something oh. on it. And so she said, what I did was from Acts 20, 20, going with Paul. And he says, after the, you know, these experiences where some people listened to him, a lot of people didn't, he had a lot of issues. But in this one verse, he said, and how I kept back nothing and so her ring said I kept back nothing I love it and I love that theme because it goes right along with what you're saying that's a very individual thing that we have to say I kept back nothing and my keeping back nothing might be different than your keeping back nothing in terms Absolutely. of where we are on the scale and what we're able to accomplish and do 
But I, I just love that theme. It goes oh, right along I with what I do love it. About. And I love this idea of searching the scriptures daily. And which, I, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, no, I just think that's what we are given the opportunity to do with the scriptures as we begin this new year of Come, Follow Me, to keep back nothing, to be completely open to what we will discover, wow. completely committed to integrating it into our lives, completely committed to acting on it in in more ways than one, just as I you have it. two different sets of acronyms for it, <laughs> um, Mariana, you know, that, that we will... We will open ourselves. We will truly try to understand and know that these things are true and then integrate them and act on them in our lives. I love that. And it just creates these pillars of testimony that anchor you to Christ. And I think that's the key. Yes. So anyway, well, what I wanted to say is the searching the scriptures daily for me covers three so I felt like, ooh, I get a mark off three of the 13 things the prophet said. The first one he said was, or, or no, it was number seven and eight, which is on the other page. Here it is. It's hiding at the bottom. So to feed yourselves truth. So as you read the scriptures and then making, strengthening your testimony of Jesus, your highest priority. And so making that time preaching, I mean, reading the scriptures a real high priority. And for me, I told you, I often forget in my busy life, I've got lots of grandchildren that just pop in the door and then we just play and play and play all day. And then it's like two o'clock in the morning when they leave, you know, <laughs> asleep and we all been have playing together. And I, ha I have a life of playing with toddlers. That's what I'm doing right now. But yes. it is, it's so fun, but it's hard to squeeze that in. And I've discovered, most of you probably know this, the um, LDS Gospel Library app has a notification setting. And so you can choose a time and it dings on your phone, time to read the scriptures. And it's like so grateful because there's so many times when it oh, dings, I, I can turn and say, I've got to read my scriptures now because the, my phone's telling me to. And for me, having that reminder helps me with the highest priority. So I don't have to remember when I'm in the middle of playing a wacky game or hide and go seek or fetch with a dog. Instead, it helps me to remember, and I'm so grateful. And then the last one that it covers was when it said, and I love this, ask him to enlighten your mind and send the help you need. So if I pray, and I like to pray at the end because I like to take everything I've said and find something to put in my prayer. And if I pray and then ask for the help I need as I go forward, I get three out of the 13 in one go. So I'm feeling like I get three drops. I'm good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually really happy with that one. But um, I think that as we look at this year and look at our symbol for Women Read Scripture, it is that lamp of oil. And not just the lamp, but remember our individual vessels, whatever they look like, whether they're small little hovels or beautiful mansions, whatever they are, that each one of us have our own vessel and we need to fill it. And I'm hoping that this experience with us talking and you sharing will be one of those things that you add individually to fill your extra vessel. I love too the symbol of the lamp because there's two things. It has light, but also with the oil, it was burning. And so there was usually some steam going up. And as we talk about the symbols of the temple, when they would burn the incense and the, you know, the, 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 smoke. the smoke would go up, that was a symbol of the prayers. Right. And so we bring the light of scripture, but we also pray with our scripture study. I know when you preach my gospel, when you, you look at preach my gospel and it talks about studying the scriptures, you know, it talks about how you should start your study with prayer and end your study okay, with prayer. Okay, I'll do both. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but I do think it allows you to be able to have that light. And I love the image of the light, but also, you know, the, this, prayer, the prayer that goes up that have wow. the two together, which That's the true. lamp with the oil does symbolize both of those things. Wow. I, I will say that um, this past year, I think it was sometime during the... the um, pandemic, one of my sons gave me a blessing. And I probably, I wasn't, I forget what the reason was, but he said, mom, in the blessing, it said, Heavenly Father knows you have lots of concerns and needs. You will have those concerns and needs addressed, but you must, and he said, 
get on your knees and pray. And I pray in so many different ways. I pray what I'm saying. I do, I do pray at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day. But that was a really helpful observation to me. And I have found when I am feeling concerned or anxious or wondering what of the many things I should do next, I now get down on my knees. It is a stop. You know, it's a period to everything I'm doing and pray. I and they that. aren't always the most perfect prayers, but I do it and it has been a great source of oil replenishment for me to do that in well, my life. You're making my brain go, woohoo! Because I was thinking, I have a close friend who has a prayer closet. And she has an extra closet, and she puts her favorite scriptures up on the wall, and then she literally closes herself in and says her prayers in her prayer closet. And I thought that was so funny. But, um, but I do think that idea of actually kneeling and having a place. I remember Joseph F. Smith had a little grove he used to go pray in, and I used to think that would be so Well, the awesome. Savior had his own sacred spots right. that and we're going to be talking about. the sacred about. grove, that same exactly. idea of separating yourself in our busy lives. Sometimes yes. we just... All right, I'm going to get a prayer forward. closet. You know, I, 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 I want a prayer <laughs> closet after oh, that. Oh, That's I great. Get, I, yeah, I just go in my regular closet. That's I do have fine. a lot of good things. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Annette, I know as a convert to the church, it is so powerful to talk about the beginning of your testimony and how it has so grown over the many decades since then. And I suppose, you know, one of the miracles of it is one of the great revelations I had, how do I find the answer to this question, to these questions, to the question, I mean, the, I, my identity came to me, I feel, from God that he just smacked me with it, with a personal <laughs> revelation. And then is Jesus the Messiah? Mm -hmm. And I came to this place where I realized you, the only way you can do this is in a different way from the way you get knowledge otherwise. It's not just reading books and writing research papers. Prayer, which was not something... I prayed, but not with that much intent. And I felt an answer. And then when I was studying the gospel, I realized I needed to clear my own very crowded mind and spirit and pray sincerely to get an answer. And once I did, I got an answer. And um, that answer was strong and clear, and it sort of dictated the rest of the choices of my life. And there were many different things that stunned me and surprised me that flowed from that. You know, I, I made this choice, and then I went back to school, and suddenly I had a whole new life to lead. It involved going to church on Sunday. It involved basically devoting Sunday to spiritual matters, not to secular matters, which was a big change for me. It involved being given callings and which uh, for which I was very grateful. We were, I was called to serve early in the little, I mean, we had a little ward in New Haven, but it covered a vast distance. And um, I was called to teach one of the groups, I think, is the beehives, were they a young women's group? Yes, yep. yes, beehives. definitely. <laughs> and um, Sister Holland was teaching the laurels, oh, so I, I got it. to drive with her in the car every day. Oh. Of course, oh. at that point, Sister Holland and Elder Holland were just, they were university students, mm -hmm. and um, Elder Holland was, while he was finishing his PhD, he was a counselor in the state presidency at the same time, so a lot of responsibility. But these were, of course, precious experiences, and even though I had no idea what it meant at that time, there's no question that those experiences were burned into my heart, the things I that I learned. Sister Holland telling me how important fasting was. I didn't know anything about mm -hmm. fasting. I didn't mm -hmm. think about it. She said she found it to be an incredibly valuable tool in her life, and I thought, that's so interesting. I would have never thought that. Sister Holland telling me about going to her bishop with a problem never think of doing that. Mm -hmm. And then you seem like a perfect person. What kind of problem would you ever have? But it was so educational for me. And as I grew in the gospel, I will say, I feel like for the first year, the Lord just covered me with his spirit. So I was mm. filled with joy and gratitude and you know, thinking, why doesn't everybody know this? Everything means so much more. Everything makes so much more sense 
with this overlay on my light. Um, but um, so in that eagerness, I wanted everybody, including my father, including the people, I mean, including the boys I dated, anybody, <laughs> that you need to understand this. And it was surprising to me that it didn't just click with them. But in the middle of that first year, my sister transferred to the same college that I went to. And um, I told her there's one, and I'd worked pretty hard to have, help make that happen. And I told her there's one thing that you have to do, and that's that you need to come with me to this institute class I go. And so she wasn't a member of the church No, no, yet. she wasn't a member wow. of the church. She was young, and she was smart, and she was beautiful. and But she was sweet, and she said, okay, I'll do it. And um, our institute class was taught by none other than Elder Holland. Oh. And we were we had a special room in And he's Brantford such an College. amazing teacher. I mean, we I, all know, know I how don't know, wonderful I don't, it is every to learn time, from him. Yes, everything he said was so wonderful. And he, he didn't necessarily stick to a lesson, but he enlightened us on an wow. ongoing basis. But um, my sister came, but not only did she do that, she was a good missionary. She was in a political science class, and she was sitting there, and a boy was next to her, and they started talking, and he said he had just come back to, she had, she had transferred. He said, oh, you just came back. He was at Brigham Young University last semester. Wow. She said, oh, are you a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? But she said, a Mormon. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. But I have friends, buddies that I used to play basketball with in Philadelphia, and they told me, come on out, we'll have a great time, you know, take a break. <laughs> so he did. He said it was really fun. I had a great time. And I'm back. She said, well, I am so happy to meet you because I am not either, but my sister is making me go to this class. <laughs> Will you come with me? Because yeah. I don't want to be the only one. Oh, that's oh. Great. So these two young people came to this class. So she was a missionary before she was even she a member was. of the church. Wow. That is because so wonderful. At the end of the year, I remember going to Elder Holland. We met at the library, and I said, you need, you and Pat need to pray with me because Katrina, my sister, believes the Book of Mormon is true, but she thinks that she can believe that but not have to be baptized. And I just know it's really important. And I remember he was, he, would look, he looked at me and he smiled and he said, we just love your enthusiasm, Annette. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you just think these things can happen. He said, but yeah, of course we'll pray with you. Well, it worked. A few months later, oh. we were home and Katrina, my sister, was crying. She said, I'm very sad, but I have to join the church. Oh, she didn't oh. want to give up her autonomy and her liberty. <laughs> I hear it. I hear it. But she did. Well, when we got back to school, we found out that this young man who had come to Elder Holland's Institute class with her was baptized on the very same day. No. Oh, oh, isn't yeah. that incredible? So what a wonderful oh, way that, what a this, great story. that this this <sighs> truth spreads out over mm -hmm. the over this it's the greatest thing we have to share. It's Daniel's it is, vision. It is. It is. And it and we we will find ways deliberate and unconscious mm -hmm. to share this as we live right. it. And to let our light shine. That idea yes. of and it is a great hands. glorious light and I'm so thankful and I feel now that I can speak with with deep understanding having lived a life seeking to be devoted having had many hard things happen mm -hmm. having a baby die having my husband die having stillborn twins having my beautiful daughter who is really extraordinary and who loved life die suddenly expire as as she did um, these are hard things and yet and yet, what I have found is that the beautiful message of the gospel, the vision that it gives us of our purpose here, our purpose eternally, the purpose those we love have eternally, the gifts the Savior has stored up for those that love him, can transform it all into oh, a wonderful journey. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. The last part of this week's lesson is this idea of how do we handle our questions and how do we handle the questions of the loved ones that we have. Now, I know all, all of us are mothers and mothers of big families. I, I have My 12. My not as big as yours. Well, I have 12 <laughs> children. Annette? I have, have 10 living. And, and I have seven. I think that's pretty spectacular, you know, that we have, between all of us, we have over 30 children. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I do feel like my two that have passed on are still an intimate part of our of lives. Of course and they are. And I know Christine feels the same way. Yeah. And so as I think of 
our children and even us individually dealing with questions and issues. I, my thought specifically went to John chapter 6, and I have to admit, I know that you're going to know how much I love John chapter 6, especially when we get there, because it is just one of my favorite parts of Scripture. But in this specific story, the Savior is expressing, you know, basically also his mission and that he is the bread of life. That's when he talks about it. And of course, the people want the real bread. They want the food. You know, they had come back because he had fed, you know, all of them the day before, right? Right. And so they followed him again, hoping for a little snack, right? (laughs) And then he, instead of feeding them physically, he feeds them spiritually. And from that experience, many fell away. Many left. And the part that that just brings such um, bittersweet feelings is when he turns to his apostles, his his chosen, and he says, um, because before that, I'm just reading 66 to 69. He says, from that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. For me, when we have questions, the the Lord's not saying, and Peter's not saying, I don't have questions. Because we know as we read Peter's story, he has lots of questions about what this New Testament means and what this new gospel means and how he's supposed to put it into practice in his own life, but also in the life of others as he preaches the gospel. But instead, the question is, Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the Christ, the anointed one that we talked about before. Well, I was going to say, this really is a weird sermon because he makes it sound like we're supposed to be cannibals. That we're going to drink his blood and eat. Well, his flesh. I can't wait for this discussion because, it, like I said, it's a it's a but wonderful I'm, sermon. It's, it's and, scary but it's, and weird, and it's weird the way he says it. It's like almost intentionally a test. Well, I think it's beautiful the way he okay, says so it. Okay, so you think it's beautiful? I love it. But it's I think one of my I was favorite one of the parts ones of scripture. That would have been like, eh. Well, this is a weird one. Well, I love that there are different ways of seeing right. it. Right. But right. I do think the key was even if you didn't understand because the sacrament hadn't been initiated. So how are we going to eat his blood and flesh? Like are we actually like when he dies is it you know there's so many questions with all the pagan like weird rituals and you're like are we becoming weirdos? So when you think of all of that, but then you go back and say but I know he's the Christ. So there has to be a moment. And that's what Peter is saying. You have that anchor, you know, and then something comes and you're like, this is weird. I'm not sure they're facing this right. I'm not sure this has been approached right. And sometimes you'll hear even general authorities and you're like, eh. but you go back to this I know. This is I my know rock. I know the gospel is this restored. Is exactly. I know this is Christ's church. And so even if I don't quite understand the beginning from the end, Even if you're being David with Bathsheba and making a mistake, I still know that this is the gospel of Christ on the earth. Exactly. And so I that phrase has come back to my mind so many times when people question a little detail. This scripture, like you're like, but it's it's the truth. And and that for me is kind of the theme for questioning. It's Lord, to whom shall we go? Right. Absolutely. No, thou hast the words of eternal life. So I'm here, even when I don't understand it. Even and I think sometimes it's maturity, spiritual maturity in terms of understanding. <laughs> you know, oftentimes when we have questions, it's like when you have a little child and you said to the little child, the child asks you, a, you know, a question. Well, why are you making me do this? And sometimes it's just because I said so. You're you're not old enough to really understand the whole picture. And so at this point, because I'm protecting you, you just have to accept it. And sometimes that's not the answer that a child wants to hear. That's not the answer we want to hear sometimes. But sometimes it is this idea of, I know that thou hast the words of eternal life, 
And so I'm going to hold on to that, and even with my questions. <laughs> so. And trust that the rest, you know, I'm thinking just of um, Judith, too, when she spoke to the elders. She said she was very upset that they were going to break their covenants to... Um, which and you know those include very specific things, but she felt to break their covenants to bow to this external force. She said because we know that the only source of save, saving grace, the only source of strength, is this God whom we love and mm -hmm. worship, and He may answer our prayers in the way that we want, but that's not the way it works. We can't just say do this for us and it happens. I love. I that. think that's so that's important. Powerful, but. We must trust that he will have a plan that will be right, that will include our being faithful. That was her thing. And, you know, I think of our lives, I, you know, where there are times when everything you want is one thing. You want one person to be well. You want one thing not to happen. And that happens. If you can stay anchored on that rock, if you can keep your commitment, to understanding that things will, that there's, there are purposes under heaven you don't understand. Eventually, slowly, line upon line, precept upon precept, you will be given not only comfort, but understanding. That's true. I believe that. And, and it may not all happen now. Some of it you have to wait. But even in this time that we live, we can get that. That's well, beautiful. I think of ask and it shall be given, knock and it shall be opened, but it says that which is expedient for you. So often we ask and we think, okay, why aren't you answering this question? But it may not be time. And sometimes the continued wondering yes. will increase your faith more than if you were given the answer right totally. away. Totally. Because you'll study more, because you, you even will stretch your faith to the point where it becomes stronger and you truly trust on the Lord and wait for his timing. But waiting on the Lord is a hard thing. It and, is. and Elder Bednar has a wonderful little clip where he talks specifically about when the children of Israel were going through the Jordan River. And he said, if you read it and see what they had to do, you know, they were like, how are we going to get across this, especially with the Ark of the Covenant? You know, this is going to be, you know, impossible. And it was the first step that they had to take before, the you know, the Jordan parted. River parted. Yeah. Yes. Water. They had to the go in into water. the dark. In faith. And I think that's kind of what faith is, is that step in the dark where we don't know. We have the question and we keep on walking in the dark, just knowing, holding on to that iron rod, holding on to that faith. And that as we do so, you know, we will eventually, I have that testimony, that we will eventually have all understanding, but it might not be in this life. It probably, a matter of fact, it probably won't be in this life. <laughs> <laughs> not all, but certainly not all understanding. And, um, and, but we do have, we do as we hold on living and loving and enjoying the life we've been given, yes. taking from it and giving to it are all in a wonderful way, right? <laughs> in a wonderful way, trying to be a prince of peace or a princess of peace, yeah. trying, trying to find the names of the Savior that we will integrate into our approach. As we do that, our path, even in the midst of thorns, even in the midst of no food, we will feel fed. And I really believe that, you know, that as we, as we learn to appreciate the wondrous things issuing forth from the scriptures, we will be fed and we will understand what it means, you know, that this is the bread of life. It's true. The thing that keeps on coming to my mind is, is Google searches, is that we all have these smartphones and there Thank is this you. attitude that you should be able to find the answer to anything right it's, away. Oh, it's I know. amazing. I and know. <laughs> I, it's sad because I think that idea of having unanswered questions and still believing is kind of out of style. But it is the gospel of Christ. It is the gospel. And that idea of faith is something I don't know how we prepare our children, how especially as they go into their young adulthood, we remind them. You may come across things you won't have the answer to. And how do we 
make their underpinnings and their foundation the point they're focusing on. And I guess the prophet said it, making your testimony of Christ your highest priority. And and I think that is the key. As we look forward, I see our future as being lots of questions, lots of things that are going to be happening in the future that are going to cause us to wonder and awe, be awe, you know, they're going to be awesome. And I mean that in the awe word. I think that as we look forward to that, we have to have that foundation. And from that foundation, we go back to what Peter said, we will not go away because to whom shall we go? We know that thou hast the words of we eternal life. And so I'm hoping that we know will be kind of our watchword as we look forward to this New Testament year. I really have a strong feeling that there's a reason why we're studying the New Testament this year. It is because our prophet has asked us to really know Jesus Christ, to understand him, to understand his words, and to understand his teachings, the doctrine. And so I'm so looking forward to studying this with you, you know, as sisters in the gospel, that we will help others also have that same foundation and faith. And we'll look for answers to the questions that we all have about everything. And the answers usually require us to endure, to they exactly. magic Defines answers. You know, and I change. Know. Yuck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being with us during this wonderful discussion. Thank you for watching Women Read Scripture. We hope to hear from you. Please write your comments below. Also, subscribe to our channel. We hope to see you again.